<laughs> okay, uh, I hope this is working. Um, thanks for joining me. Um, yeah, my name is Nathan Fairbairn. Uh, I am a comic book colorist, uh, have been for uh, over 13 years now, uh, full-time professionally. Um, uh, and this is a, a little workshop on how I do my job. Um, it's being presented by Bandcalf, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, it's a bummer. What's going on? Uh, I miss the Comic Con. I miss Vancaf in particular. Vancaf is a great show, uh, and I'm really looking forward to uh, getting back to it. Hopefully next year. But in the meantime, um, it's important to stay connected. So I'm uh, I'm glad to be able to do this um, for them. So uh, yeah, a little bit about myself. Um, I've been doing this for a while. I've uh, worked for Marvel, DC. Um, image, uh, pretty much every major comic book publisher. Uh, current projects include, I'm working on uh, Jimmy Olsen with the fantastic uh, Mr. Steve Lieber and Mr. Matt Fraction. Um, I think issue 10 of that should be coming out soon. Um, I'm also working on Die 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 with Chris Burnham and Robert Kirkman and Scott Gimple. Um, and that is also coming out. I think we're on issue nine of that. Um, and current projects also include uh, Wonder Woman Earth One with uh, Yannick Paquette, who I've been working with uh, for about 10 years now. I've worked with most of these guys for a long time. In the past, I've also colored uh, the, excuse me, I'm just gonna stand up here. Uh, this guy, Scott Pilgrim. Uh, so yeah, I've done a lot of stuff. And I've also written and uh, colored and lettered my own book uh, called Lake of Fire, which has been out for a couple of years now. And I'm working on a couple other creator-owned things. Um, so yeah, uh, let's talk about the workshop in particular. Um, this workshop is intended for people who have some familiarity with Photoshop, um, but not a lot. You don't really need to know it that in depth for what I'm going to be going through today. Um, I guess you'd call it an introductory, uh, um, but a crash course in coloring. I'm, gonna, I'm going to try to take a whole page uh, from uh, just the inks all the way to finish in an hour. So I've chosen a very simple page because normally it takes me about three hours more depending on depending on the art. Um, I colored seconds with Brian Lee O'Malley and uh, yeah, I don't know if you can see this is, but uh, pretty, pretty, pretty clean, flat colors. Love this book, uh, not least because I could color uh, as many as ten pages in a day. <laughs> I went from that project to working on Pax Americana with Frank Quitely, and uh, these pages took uh, almost a whole day each just because I was being so precious with Frank. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to be coloring a page from Scott Pilgrim um, that I've already colored. But, um, hopefully that'll make it quicker for me. Um, tools, I use um, uh, Photoshop, as I've mentioned. Uh, a lot of artists are now using, um, it used to be called Manga Studio, Clip Studio, Clip Studio Pro, Clip Studio Paint, something like that. I don't use it. Uh, I've heard great things, um, especially for uh, line artists. Um, I know that Yannick uh, Paquette, he draws everything in there, and then uh, I color it in Photoshop. Uh, I know some colors who've started to use it for coloring, um, especially flatting, which is the initial stage of just filling in blocks of color on the page, um, and they really like it for that. So I'm um, an old dog, and I... I haven't learned that new trick yet. Um, so I use Photoshop, and I also have a uh, uh, Wacom uh, Cintiq uh, monitor. Let me just, ah, it worked. Um, so this is uh, the monitor where I work. Um, it's not, I didn't get the touch screen version because I wasn't quite sure how that worked with my hand constantly on it. And it was also an extra thousand dollars, so I didn't see the need for that. But this is a really beautiful um, it's a Cintiq Pro, I think it's 24 inches or whatever. 
Um, but I started out, I was, you know, well, I started out using a mouse, which I do not recommend. Um, I heard an urban legend that, that Adam Hughes still colors with a mouse, but I, I, I cannot believe it's true. Uh, maybe it is, I don't know. Uh, there's a lot of ways to make art out there. Um, uh, but uh, I started out with a mouse, that didn't last very long, and then I switched to a little tablet, an Intuos tablet, so I would be, my hand would be down on the desk drawing and my eyes would be looking forward at the monitor, and there was that kind of disconnect. Um, and so as soon as the Cintiq became available, um, I picked one up, and I've been using one for 11 or 12 years. They are pricey, um, I'm not going to lie about that. Um, I think there are alternatives to using the... Uh, Cintiq. I, yeah, I'm sure there are knockoffs. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, okay. So, uh, we might as well get started with the actual... Or, oh, other uh, things I have. Of course, I've got a keyboard, obviously, but I also have this little doohickey, which is a speed pad. I think gamers use it. It's made by Razer, but uh, I've just mapped all my quick commands onto that speed pad um, instead of doing, you know, shift option or whatever or like actions and stuff I've just mapped them onto there and I can do all of my uh, quick commands with my left hand while my right hand is, is working. Okay well let's pull up this page and, uh, and get cracking on it. Um, do, do, do. Hang on let's make sure I've checked all of my notes. Indeed. All right where is this bad boy? Thanks. There we go. All right first thing make it a big screen. Okay, um, I do not want to be looking at that dock. Bear with me in one moment. There we go. Yeah, okay, go, go with dock. <sighs> All right, so uh, first step of coloring a comic page is looking at the line art that you're dealing with. Um, typically, you're going to get line art that is either bitmapped or that is grayscale. Uh, bitmap just means that uh, the pixel is either 100% black or 100% white. There's no in-between. Grayscale obviously means that there are there's a scale of gray between the black and the white. Um, I, yeah, I can work with either and do work with either all the time. Um, uh, this, there's not really a big difference in the way you, you treat either, but um, there is, I guess there is for me. Uh, if I get really clean bitmapped line art, um, uh, I tend to want to work in CMYK. There's two color modes you can work in in Photoshop. Um, and if I get really clean line art like this, um, yeah, I don't know why. I, I, I like to color that one in CMYK. I generally work with art with grayscale files and work in RGB. But when I get nice clean art like this, uh, I like to go back to my roots, which is coloring in CMYK. I started coloring everything in the CMYK color space, um, and then uh, shifted to RGB uh, after a couple of years. There's a long story there why that happened, but essentially I decided I, I had to give up control over the final printer outcome. Um, I thought if I worked in CMYK, I would be controlling the final print, but of course there's a million factors between me sending the file off and then coming out in print. And, uh, and I just like the way RGB handles um, color mixing, um, especially like effects and stuff like that. So if you're doing like superhero books with lots of glowy shit, oh, glowy stuff, um, RGB works well. But for a nice clean book like this, I'm not going to be doing a lot of special effects, uh, mostly flat coloring. I like to work in CMYK. So let's take this uh, bitmapped file. You can look here. You can see, I don't know if you can quite see the pixels, but uh, they are black or white. So first thing to do is let's change this, convert it to um, CMYK. Am I working with CMYK? All right. So now that is in a CMYK color space. And now we have to get ready to work with these lines. So I grab my uh, wand, which is W, it's over here. Okay. Uh, and you can just select all of these lines here. Then open up a new layer. Just make everything, make the lines 100% black, fill it, uh, 
I'll change it to darken, and I lock off that layer, and I'll call that layer limits. There we go. And then I'll just turn this background into just a regular layer. And now you can see I have a simple layer here. I'll call this layer flats. Okay. And then the inks are above them. And the inks are above them, and they're just set to darken. There's these. I've got it locked off so I don't accidentally switch layers and start coloring my line art. I don't want to touch my line art. Um, and up here you can see there's all these different color modes darken, which means that whatever the pixel is underneath um, that in the under layer, in the flats layer, like say I put, I don't know, just pink, let's put some pink there. So that pink is 43% magenta, and because the um, layer above it, inks, is 100% black, if I took my eyedropper tool and click in there, oh, that's mysterious, why the hell is it doing that? <laughs> okay. That's where it says 22 and 22. Oh, I didn't have my pencil on the photo pass. This is fun. Okay. So anyway, 22% uh, uh, magenta on the color layer there. And then the inks are just going on top of it, 22. All right. So let's get to work. Um, there's three main tools for flatting. Um, there is the lasso tool, um, which is... You can make selections with it. You can grow those selections. You can shrink those selections, make them smaller. Um, and it's just a matter of knowing which uh, command keys to hold down while you're using those lasses. Um, shift makes it. So there's your selection area. So let's make it just a circle. And then you hold down Shift. And then you can add selection areas to that. Or if you hold down Option, you can subtract selection areas from that selection. And then deselect the whole thing. Um, yeah, I probably use the lasso mostly, but uh, for a nice clean line art like this, um, you can use the wand quite well. Uh, you set the wand to contiguous up here at the top, and then you get sample all layers. And then I can just click inside this hair here. Voila. And what I could do now is I could just um, fill it with, um, I don't know, Scott hair color, which is roughly orange. Um, but the problem with that is that the, you have the, the lines going, the color going right up to the lines, but not under the lines. You really do want the colors underneath the inks to go right together um, and to go underneath the lines. Otherwise, you know, I'll just do this face here in a basic skin, Scott skin tone like that. And then what you end up with is that. That is bad. Um, the colors should all come together. They shouldn't be leaving space for the for the inks. So again, let's just get rid of all that, and let's try again. So you select the hair, and then select, modify, expand, and you can probably expand it by about two pixels, and you can see how the little marching ants uh, go underneath the line. Uh, I would go a little further. Um, this is a pain going select, modify, expand. So I, have, of course, have written an action to expand or to, to shrink my selection. Um, definitely recommend you do that. Um, and then once I have uh, got a selection area I like, I can fill it with, again, Scott's ridiculous orange hair. There we go. Um, and then I would take my lasso tool here. And then I can just make this selection area here. So when you're flatting, you tend to use a variety of tools in combination. Um, but usually it's the lasso, the wand, and the brush tool. So there's a decent skin tone. It's a little jaundiced. There we go. Um, you might notice I'm using the CMYK sliders up at the top right hand here to pick my colors. Um, I really recommend you get uh, good at that. Uh, well, I don't know, I guess do what you want. A lot of people will click in there and you get like a little color picker and they'll just grab their colors from in there. Uh, that's fine, especially if you're working in RGB, but if you are working in CMYK, for me the whole reason to work in CMYK is to have absolute not absolute, but a lot of control over the actual ink values that you're using. Um, 
and for me, I like to be able to pick my colors, and it's almost like mixing on a palette. You know, a little bit of cyan, a little bit of magenta, a little bit of yellow. Um, I don't use blacks hardly ever in my colors. Um, sometimes, you know, sometimes you do want things to be really dark, um, and uh, you have no choice but to add a bit of black to them. Um, I've got a really cool book uh, that I should have pulled out before called Color State. And it actually is just a book of colors uh, and all their CMYK RGB values. So this is more for designers who are like picking one color for a thing and they want it to be just the perfect color of something. But um, I don't know, if you have a project and you're setting the color of something that you're going to be repeating a lot, uh, interesting uh, resource to have. But I've just gotten really good at, at mixing cyan, magenta, and yellow together to get the colors I want. Um, yeah. So now if we look, you can see that the colors are all coming together underneath the lines, which means that they're good flats. Uh, knives channel space here. I'm just going to make her a white eyeball. I don't like to go completely white with uh, eyeballs in the flatting phase because then if I try to grab just the white of the eye and I've got the gutters white, it'll grab all that. Anyway, let's fill this with some generic background color. And the reason I did this and I left a ton of space is because I'm just going to hit it with the wand afterwards. Throw out a few pixels and fill it like that. Okay. Um, Let's see, or another way to do that would be to do that. Uh, anyway, we've got our panels kind of like that. Uh, let's give knives a little jacket. I could probably be using the wand for this as well. There's some nice closed lines. Sure, that's a jacket. Um, let's try the wand there. And I'm obsessive, so I like to just make sure that I get the full selection area. And what color is Scott's coat? Mm, it's mostly blue. It's been a while since I colored Scott's coat in. Yeah, that looks about right. So I just used the, uh, the bucket tool. So I've made my selection area, and then I use the paint bucket tool to fill it in. Um, oh, a note about using your... Uh, lasso tool. So lasso tool is great. Um, and you fill it in with whatever color there. And if you look, you can see there's the little stepping stones here. <laughs> I call them ste or steps, stairs. Um, when you have an alias selection, so up here, I don't know if you can see uh, where my monitor, my cursor is, but there's the anti-alias box. If you check that box, then you end up with a blurry I don't know, it's as close as I can zoom here. So on the right, you have the anti-alias selection, and on the left, you have the alias selection. Um, never use the anti-alias, uh, especially in the, in the flatting uh, phase. I, I never use it, period. But um, uh, if you do, it makes it really hard for you to grab uh, that selection. So you see here, if I select on the left with my... Um, wand tool, it grabs every single bit of that blue, because it's 100% that color. There's no gray area between the light blue and the dark blue. Um, if you try to grab on the right, uh, it only grabs the 100% dark blue, and the middle pixels, it just doesn't grab. Um, so it's, yeah, you don't want, you don't want any alias in your selections. You want them to be nice, clean alias selections. And that goes for all of your tools, your, your uh, wand tool as well. Okay, back to it. Now we can get a nice eyeball. Again, I'll just go slightly off-white. And just draw a little eyeball there. Can't get enough. And now I'm using the brush, which is over here. And same thing. In her eyeball. Let's do her hand here. 
So this, as you can probably tell, is the tedious part of coloring comic books. And it's also a really time-consuming part, especially if you have, I mean, this is a really simple page. I can flat this page, even while talking and doing all of this in 20 minutes. Um, but uh, a lot of colors, including me, um, we don't flat all of our own pages. Um, we have subcontractors who we will hire to um, do exactly this and then send us the file. Um, some colorists work really closely with their flatters and will actually um, give them a palette to work from or just let them pick colors and they'll try to incorporate them into their own. I'm a bit of a control freak and so I have flatters who have been uh, expressly forbidden from... <laughs> I tell them don't try to color the page, just flat the page. Um, and they send me just clown colors, you know, pink hair, blue skin, whatever literally randomly generated colors. Um, the only thing that matters, of course, is that the hair is the same in each panel. So when I go to grab the hair, I can grab all the, all the hair at the same time. But I like to know that all the final colors on the page are from me. So when they send me a page in ridiculous colors, I actually like it because then I feel like, okay, I'm the one who's actually making all the choices uh, on the page. But I love my flatters. I couldn't do half as much as I get done in a day if I, uh, if I didn't have them working for me. My main flatter is a guy named Wilson Anthony Go. He lives in the Philippines, and he is the shit. Um, yeah, um, yeah. Flatters don't get enough credit in this industry. Uh, when I have my own books, like Lake of Fire, I, I, I give a credit in the uh, credits of my book for, for Wilson's work. Um, but the rest of the industry doesn't really credit flatters. I can, I, I guess, I see why. Like I said, they don't really affect the final look of the book. They just make it easier for me to do my job. Um, but it's still a very important thing, and I'm, I really appreciate their work. Uh, okay, so there's Scott's fuzzy jacket thing. All right, so we're going to do the other panels now, maybe a little quicker, a little less talking. Um, try the wand there. That works. Let's give it a couple pixels. Make sure we're getting all of this area here. That looks good. And then I use the eyedropper, which if you have your bucket or your brush, you can just hold down option and it'll give you the eyedropper tool. And then I use the bucket to fill in that. It's really important to use the same, um, the same color for the same thing on a page. All right. And of course, I realized that I just colored his eyeball skin color, so we'll change that. Uh, this is his pupil, so let's use something like that. Again, this is just the flatting. I'm not really making any choices here. Um, we'll get to that in a minute. I'm just focused on getting colors down on the page. Um, Normally when I flat, I am making choices, but right now, since we're kind of just talking about the technical side of flatting, um, I, I want to separate those two things. Okay, so we got an eyeball. Uh, let's do knives now. I think this is all... <laughs> let's make this all eyeball. Uh, we'll decide later. How does that look if it's all eyeball? That's funny. I'm gonna leave it like that. Oh, let's go with that for now. Okay. Knives. There we go. A little bit of spit down here. What are we doing for time? Oh, not bad. All right. Okay. Spit. Great. Good job. Hair. I like to separate, um, if you have, you know, hands on face or, you know, one leg in front of another, um, you have two things that are the same color overlapping each other. I like to give them a little bit of separation uh, in the flats. Um, 
maybe I'll decide to leave it all the same color later, but it just makes it easier to work with it later. I can, I can then go in and just grab the hands or the face and do my rendering um, on those areas separately. Um, I don't generally like to color <laughs> Brian or Scott's fingernail, but what the hell. So I'm just using the wand tool here, grabbing them, drawing the selection by a few pixels, and there you go. Grabbing grab that, and I think we'll make that darker. Oops. And jacket. Okay, almost done. So, um, yeah, as I said, a page usually does take me about three hours. This is one of the easiest pages I've ever colored, which is why I chose it. Um, but that's three hours with the flatting phase already done. Hopefully when I'm done this page, I'll, still, I'll have five, ten minutes at the end of this, and I can show you um, how I would uh, tackle a slightly more complicated page, um, Amazing Spider-Man, for, for example. Um, but let's just get this done. And I'm not really sure what Brian's <laughs> drawn here. Uh, that's part of being a colorist, is looking at it and going, okay, what the hell is that underneath her chin, or is this a bit of her hair, or I don't know. So you have to kind of make make a determination at some point, um, or just ask the artist, what the hell did you just draw? And uh, they can go, oh no, that's eyelid, or <laughs> whatever. Um, yeah, so again, making the hands a slightly different color. Uh, nail polish. I'm using the brush now. Okay, so uh, we can look at the page, and now you see that there are colors underneath. Um, they all come together like that. Haven't touched the inks above. You can see the inks are on a transparency layer. Well, uh, above. Um, yeah, that's basically how that's done. Um, so I flatted the page. That is step one of a uh, coloring a comic book page. Um, like I said, I wasn't really making any choices here. I was just using the local colors or the, you know, the coloring book colors that you would use if you were just coloring in a coloring book. Local color is the actual color of an object um, in natural uh, lighting without any affected light or um, uh, stuff going on. Um, most of most of stuff is fine with, with local color, uh, especially in, you know, I mean, it's comic books, especially if I'm working in like superhero stuff. I want to keep those characters in their recognizable uh, costume colors um, as much as possible, uh, because for me, uh, anyway, I know a lot of colors would disagree with that, but for me, comics are very bright, and uh, you know, um, I have this nostalgic connection to uh, the original superhero comic books, where you know, Superman could have been flying underwater or you know, through the sun, and he would still be the exact same color of red and blue and yellow. Um, they didn't change, which I don't go that far, but I try to use. I try to use local colors where I can. Um, yeah, oh, there's a chat. <laughs> uh, okay, there's one question that says, doesn't the printer take it back to CMYK? The printer absolutely does take it back to CMYK. So if you're working in RGB, you have to convert it to CMYK before you send it in. Um, yeah, uh, is he flipping back and forth from polygonal lasso tool to regular lasso tool? Ooh, that's a good question. Uh, I kind of am. Um, so if you have the lasso tool, so up here, um, polygonal means the lasso works in straight lines, and um, the other one, it, you can draw with it, essentially. But the cool thing about this tool is that 
Once you start drawing, you can hold down the Option key and it turns into um, a polygonal lasso tool. So you can start doing straight lines in addition to curvy lines. So you can really control. So I think that is a, I mean, that is, that is key. I, I've been teaching my daughter how to flat. And when I taught her that trick, it kind of le leveled her up uh, a little bit. Because if you're making a long, you know, painful, tedious selection, like say we're selecting this hair, it's irritating. And it's nice to be able to just pick up your pen and hit those contact points and then maybe do a little curve here. So yeah, being able to switch back and forth on the polygonal lasso tool to um, the regular one, very handy. And it's just holding down the option key while you are working. Uh, other questions? Do, do, do. Uh, bring your inks. Did you bring your inks into channels and back into layers? No, I did not. Uh, I don't use channels very much at all, except when I am making a uh, selection in grayscale. I almost never uh, use my channels. If I'm selecting the inks in grayscale, then sure, I would go into channels to make sure that I grab all of them. And hopefully, like I said, I'll have time to show you how I would set up a grayscale page, uh, a Spider-Man page. Okay, uh, back to what I was talking about. Uh, I actually can't remember what I was talking about. So, right, um, choices. So making choices. So most of the time in Scott Pilgrim, I am using a lot of local color. Um, a lot of just things are colored the way they would be in natural lighting or whatever, uh, like that sort of thing. No, they're inside. They're not going to be dramatically lit in red. Um, but that, that said, um, you know, sometimes it's nice to do an interesting color setup. Um, and it's also, um, when you're coloring, you know, I think there's two ways to approach a page with color. You can go for a realist approach, uh, where, again, you're just coloring things the way that they would look in real life. Uh, and then there's the expressionist approach, where you want to... Um, convey something through the colors that's not literally true that, that you know like if there's a sudden moment of emotional angst or um, you know uh, you you want to emphasize that moment through color that, you know characters aren't actually turning pink or whatever but the reader knows that and they can they can parse that and go oh, okay this is just a, a high key moment so this page actually is one of those moments um, you know it comes in volume six and, and Scott and uh, knives are kissing for the first time and it's awful. Um, I can't remember the exact line. I think it, the line is, but it was horrible for everyone and that includes you. Uh, and so I really wanted when I colored this page to uh, make it um, a very powerful and kind of unsettling. Um, and so I went with a very expressionist color on this one. So I've got my flats done now. First thing I do always is I duplicate my layer. And now I've got a copy of my flats layer, and I'll call this one, I don't know, renders. Um, and I lock off my flats layer underneath. So now I have um, a layer there where I can make my selections. I can grab uh, colors, um, and I can work in this layer here and not affect that flats layer underneath. It just makes it nice to have that as a backup if I need to go and recolor something I've, I've done some rendering. Okay, so now I've got um, another layer to work with here, and first thing I want to do is change this background color and make it something a bit shocking. So let's go with 100% magenta and 100% yellow. Uh, let's make that very, very red. Um, it's a good start, um, but it's not quite enough. Again, sometimes a bit changing the background color red like that is, I mean, that's all you really want to do or have to do to, to really key up that moment, but uh, I wanted to make this whole thing seem kind of surreal and unsettling, um, and so I, I went with like very, very crazy colors on them as well. Um, and the first one, they're kissing, I kind of wanted to tie them together because they're kissing and there's this, you know, there's this moment of, uh, of, of connection. So, um, let's see, I won't get the colors exactly right, but um, yeah. maybe something like, uh, I'm just looking at the print on my page here, and <laughs> trying to guess what the uh, CMY values are. 
Yeah, that looks horrible, but I think that might be right. Let's go with uh, a little more of this. You get, when you've done this for as long as I, I've colored like 8,000 pages, you can just look at a page and you actually kind of guess what the, the CMY values are. And then let's go with 100% of that. And go with 75. Yeah, that's good. And the coat, eh, maybe just a little more of that. Whatever. So, it's a little lighter. And let's just, because I'm trying to connect them together and make them, you know, a unit here, I'm going to give them the exact same skin tone. I'm going to make her jacket go somewhere as well. Not bad. And let's pop their eye color. Let's make that a little bit yellow. Let's go with uh, yeah, that works. Cool. All right. So I've kind of got them blended together there. Um, that works for me. And the next one, there's this separation between them. They're kind of pulling apart from each other. And I really wanted to like show that contrast and show that negative space between them. So the red just wouldn't work for me there. So I went with actually like a super, super blue on there. Um, so let me just look, what did I use for blue? Uh, well, pretty much full cyan, somewhere around there. Um, somewhere around there. A little less yellow. Yeah. Okay, make a little selection. Yeah, that's what I did. Ridiculously blue. <laughs> Same. And actually, let's uh, let's change it just slightly, but let's make this fit basically the same color there. And then his hair. Oh, let's make that eyeball a little darker. There we go. That is ridiculous. And then the hair. Was it? Yeah. Basically the same, except just darker. Looks pretty good. Um, maybe a little less of that. Yeah, let's just go with that. That looks good. I don't normally talk to myself quite this much when I'm coloring, but I definitely do talk to myself. Okay, um, so now uh, hopefully you can see that there's this, you can see that red space between them is really emphasizing the separation between the two of them. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's what I was thinking when I colored this page. So the together and then apart, and then they kind of break off into their own worlds of shame. And, uh, so let's color him in the blues. Um, and let's see. And let's keep her in the reds. Um, oops, missed multiple levels of undo, people. I couldn't live without it. There, so now they're, I've kind of really separated them. He's off in his own sad blue world, and she's in her red shame world. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I mean, this is an extreme example of, uh, of using color to tell story. Um, but I think that is the job. Um, some, you know, if I was doing this on every page, it would be ridiculous if they're just, you know, there's plenty of scenes where they're just sitting around having a cup of coffee or nachos or something. If everyone suddenly became hot pink for no reason, it would be, it would take you out of the story rather than adding to the story. So less is more with this kind of thing, in my opinion. A lot of colorists do a lot more expressionist coloring than I do. Most of my coloring is fairly literal. Um, and uh, and I you know I work with artists and they um, they will they will have ideas as well about what uh, they want to see. Um, some of them really hate expressionist coloring, um, and I have to sell them on it when I do use it. Quitely, actually, Frank Quitely, um, I, ha I had to fight for a couple expressionist uses of color. Um, yeah, uh, 
in, in the book that I do at Temple called Pax Americana, which was like six years old, but still one of my uh, uh, proudest books. So anyway, uh, this is extreme expression. All right, um, so now I have a color scheme that I like. Um, and now the question becomes to render or not. Oh, actually, before I move on to that, I, I see that the notes are piling up. Uh, inks, so are inks on multiply? No inks are on dark. Oh, someone's already answered that question. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, people are, list are actually listening. That's great. Um, okay, so back to coloring the page. The question is, uh, how much rendering is too much rendering? And how much is not enough? Um, so, like I showed you, I showed you seconds uh, before. Let's just escape this page here. Um, so seconds was flat color. There's, if you look at the pages here, um, there's no paint strokes. There's no. There's not even any really cuts. Uh, I threw a, a light on the floor there just to put her in the sun. I thought that was clever, but uh, for the most part. Things are just flat colors in this book. Uh, and it's very powerful, uh, and it really fits the line art, uh, which is why I did it that way. Uh, I don't tend to get to work with a lot of guys whose line art looks best flat. Most of the people I work with uh, enjoy uh, a lot of uh, rendering. Uh, this is Brad Walker, who I did Batman with. Um, uh, lots of fun. Uh, let's see here. I did Batman with Chris Burnham as well. Um, this is getting older, this material here. Um, and the Quietly pages that I've mentioned, I think I've already shown these, but uh, a, lot of, a lot of little detail that I put into uh, faces and things like that. It really just depends on what you think suits the line art. Um, and you have to work with the artist on that. Uh, I think if you aren't, you know, listening to what the artist wants, then you, I don't know what you're doing. I mean, I get it. Sometimes colorists, they're handed a, an issue by a publisher and said, yeah, we need this color in three days. Uh, you don't have time to be reaching out to the artist and getting all their notes about what they like and what they don't like. But if possible, uh, definitely do that. Um, because, yeah, a lot of artists have very specific ideas about the way they like to be colored, and uh, I always, always want to take that into account. All right, back to um, coloring this page. Uh, I should also note that I haven't saved. <laughs> this is still ink, so if my computer crashed right now, I, I would have lost all the work that I did, but I don't care because this came out in print about five years ago, so this is purely for educational purposes. But it is a good note, you should save frequently. Um, okay, so rendering though. Uh, I did do a fair amount of rendering on Scott Pilgrim. Well, not a fair amount. I, I did what's called cuts. Uh, I'm sure there's another more appropriate term for it in the animation world, but in comics we call them cuts, uh, which is where you are basically um, separating out an area into a highlight and a low light. Um, so I want some of this red. I want more red on the figures, so I'm just going to go in, I'm going to use my lasso tool here, and I'm just going to make I'll just decide that the light is hitting them from above. It's not even real light, it's just, you know, expressionist light. That looks alright. And then I'll pull back a lot of that blue and I'll just keep hitting it with, keep changing the colors until I'm happy with the punch of the red on his hair. Something like that, sure. Yeah, and then I'll kind of do the same for his skin tone. Uh, let's go with a little bit more bright. Yeah. That's working for me. A little bit of his ear there. Looks fairly terrible though. If you hit. Okay. Hmm. Sure, why not? 
get right zoom in there. Here's his little nose. Uh, here's where it's handy that I have colored her skin slightly different from his, so that I can just deselect her skin from that selection. And I can fill it in. Pardon me. Cheers. I don't normally talk this much while I work. Uh, yeah. This is getting a bit sloppy because I've kind of reached the point where I don't much care since I've already done this, but you can see what I'm doing where I'm just like putting a highlight on there, punching it up a bit. Maybe make her fingers down to the second knuckle there. Where, or where there would be a knuckle if Brian actually drew knuckles. Uh, which is not in any way a criticism, I'm really glad he doesn't draw knuckles. Right, sure, good enough. Let's maybe splash a color on her uh, on her jacket here. Something like that. Mm. I don't know, whatever. Doop -doop -doop. Sure. And a little bit in his jacket. I don't know, something like this. Yeah, what the hell? There. I like that. And of course we gotta add a bit of light to his fuzzy hood. It's funny, this is bringing me back to when I initially colored. So because I didn't do a lot of rendering, every single selection, every single cut I did, I agonized over. Uh, I spent way too long. Yeah. Oh, is this the exact right bit? Um, yeah, doing it now, I don't care. But uh, essentially, that's what I did on this page. Um, and then, yeah, uh, what's, what else is there to do? Oh, another trick. Yeah, okay, not a trick, but... Um, you see here they've got these little scribbles on their cheeks. Uh, that's to indicate a blush. Um, and it looks dirty uh, in <laughs> color. So, uh, man, I know I said I don't care about these selections, but I kind of care about these selections. Uh, they're messy. Whatever. Um, right, so again, back to the, uh, the little blushes on their cheeks. Uh, in black and white it works. In color it looks like they've got tar or dirt or something smudged on their cheeks. So, uh, I like to do color holds. Color holds are when you basically make a selection area out of the inks, and then you color just within that selection area. So, first thing is selecting, uh, the inks layer. Um, and I have done this so many times with my quick commands, I don't even know what button I'm pushing down anymore. Uh, option. Option click on the inks layer. And then you pop it up, Another new, make a new layer down here at the bottom, there's that little square, create a new layer, click on that, it makes a new layer. And then we do this thing here, uh, which is add layer mask, boom. And then you click on there. And now you have a selection area where you can just color within that selection area. Color the little, little blushes. Color holes. Yay. Uh, I really hate these selections I've made. <laughs> uh, apparently I can't just be half-ass about a thing. Okay, so let's uh, color these little blushes down here. That's actually a little too light, they won't really show up in the print. There we go, that's better. Yeah, uh, I like to label my layers just so I know what the hell's going on. Um, it's kind of a holdover from my earlier ways of working where I would have dozens of layers and I would get completely lost in what everything was. Um, nowadays, my pages don't tend to get a lot more complicated than what you're seeing here. I've got four layers. Um, I can add a fifth layer right now. I can teach you about uh, trapping. So trapping is, um, how do I explain this? So if you look at the inks here, um, I don't know, I'm just gonna 
make another layer here and uh, make a bit of make a lighter color. So if you look at the where I'm eye dropping here, so this is 32, 34, um, and now it's 100 and 32, 134. Um, yeah, so that color which is 100% black, but only 32, 34, is gonna be lighter in print than 100, 100, 100. And especially if anything gets printed off register, um, you, you really want those blacks to be supported by a uniform color. Um, sometimes a trap is called support. Uh, another thing to be careful of is because I've got this 100% uh, magenta, 100% yellow, and then the 100% black on top, I have a total ink limit of 300. Uh, which is far in excess of the recommended um, total ink volumes um, on the uh, paper that, I say paper, laminated toilet paper that most comics are printed on. Uh, they just can't soak up that much ink. Uh, so I try to keep my ink values uh, two fo uh, down to 240. Um, it's just what I've always used. Works out well. Um, I don't even know where I got that number from. I think I probably learned it. Uh, back in the message board days when I learned how to color from uh, such greats as Dave McCaig and Laura Martin and Chris Sotomayor and Alex Sinclair and uh, uh, Matt Hollingsworth. One of them gave me uh, those figures probably. But anyway, uh, it's important to, to trap your, your pages. So that's easy enough. Again, you just option click on the inks layer and you've selected all the inks and then your support color is 60 cyan, 40 magenta, and 40 yellow. Um, yeah, and then you just shrink that by a couple pixels. So you go right there, and then you can fill it. So this is what the traps look like. You can see that they are not quite as neat because, again, I shrunk that selection area, and then the inks go above that. And now, if I eyedropper, I get that 60, 40, 40, 100, that total of 240 ink value underneath all of my inks, except for up at the very edge where the colors should run right, under, right underneath the inks. Uh, yeah, and then I'll lock that off. And that actually is pretty much the whole job uh, of coloring a comic book page. Uh, then the lettering is added. Let me uh, pull up, I have this. Here's the actual file that I used when I um, colored. This is the actual working file that I used. So I got the flats, put my own colors in, and then I did my rendering, got my inks, my traps, I did my color holds. Oh yeah, and I had a little effect layer here. <laughs> I forgot about that. So just a little layer of circles. Um, and that was actually an idea that I got from the black and white edition. The black and white uh, editions of Scott Pilgrim were, oh, I'm going to screw this up, John, no, I don't want to screw it up. Give me a minute. Let me look. Uh, they were gray toned. Um, Brian had a, a wonderful artist do the gray tones in the first black and white edition um, of Scott Pilgrim. Ah, John Kentz, that was his name. And he did a great job of adding um, some volume and, and just doing a great job of shading everything in, in grayscale. And I really wanted to respect his work. Um, and so I, I spent a ridiculous amount of time uh, reproducing uh, all of his grayscale effects in color. Uh, I didn't want to just uh, erase uh, his contributions. So uh, yeah, so that circle there was all John. Brilliant. Um, Bullseye, right where they're kissing. Uh, smart, smart man, John. Um, and that's the page, and then, oh yeah, and then there's text on top. But it was horrible for everyone, and that includes you. Voila, and that is how a comic book page is colored. Uh, I have a few minutes left, let me just look at the questions. Uh, making notes. Uh... <laughs> hey man, do you usually work with so few layers? <laughs> do you put every do you ever put highlights and shadows on different layers? I did when I started. Uh, like I said, I used to work with dozens of layers and it just got to be such a mess. And like I said, I've colored I don't know, over over 7,000 pages, probably closer to 8 since I last counted um estimated really. 
Um, so, and I have to color like three or four pages a day. And uh, it just, it just, it just, I, the more I worked, the more confident I got. And I just started laying colors all down in one layer. Um, and uh, yeah, most of, most of my pages are, are dead simple like that. I've seen people whose setup is bananas. Well, not bananas, but uh, my brain is is too old and full of worms to work like that anymore. Uh, my my dear friend uh, Michelle Asarasicorn, who colors Isola, is a brilliant colorist and a wonderful cartoonist. Um, and she put out this little booklet on how she uh, colors Isola and presumably everything else. And it is. <laughs> It is. I, I I could barely understand what she's doing. It's it's brilliant. Um, but uh, yeah, Photoshop is this massive, uh, complicated program that I think none of us ever use more than ten to fifteen percent of. Um, and she uses a different ten to fifteen percent than I do. Um, but for me, simplicity is key. Uh, minimal. Um, so yeah, that's the answer to that question. Um, do do do. Yeah, good enough. Oh, someone says is trapping built into Photoshop. Yeah, I know. I just like to do it myself. Again, having control over the uh, pixels on the page is kind of important to me. Uh, right. Okay. So let's uh, let's grab a Spidey page. All right. So here's a page of Spidey. I don't even know if this has come out yet because of shops being closed. I think it was supposed to come out like the week shops close. I don't know if you've seen this, but this is a grayscale page. You can see, because if you zoom in close enough, you can see that these are not perfectly black and perfectly white lines. Now you can turn them into those, and that's easy enough. You go image, adjustment, threshold, and you can mess with the threshold to basically grab, it'll base, what the threshold does is decide whether the gray is a white or a black. Um, and the more you slide it over here, the more it decides that the gray is a white, and the more you slide it over here, the more it decides that the gray is black. Um, usually you want to leave it somewhere in the middle. Uh, depends on how light they are, though. Um, I don't like to do that with grayscale images. I find, um, I don't know, I, I just I just don't like to do it. I, I think it, there is charm in that gray. There's charm uh, in the imperfections of the line art. Um, to just turn it up, and, I don't know feels a bit stiff. It's silly because of course I'm working at 600 dpi um, and it's not going to be printed at that resolution and it's you're going to lose a lot of that charm anyway but <laughs> I want I want the image to be as uh, as good as I can make it before I send it off to be butchered by the, the printer. Um, oh god I I had a thing yeah anyway so that's how you that's how you turn something into a uh, a bitmap, bitmapped image where you have all black or all white. Um, you can't really tell the difference when you're zoomed out, but I know what the difference there. So let's work with this in a grayscale really quickly. I know I've only got a few minutes left. Um, so I'm going to leave it in grayscale, and I'm going to work with this one in RGB, uh, just like RGB, for doing effects and stuff. So you'll see when you've got grayscale, the the wand tool is less um, less awesome uh, because it's only grabbing the white there, and all the little gray bits don't get don't get grabbed by it. Uh, you can you can fix that a bit by changing the tolerance up at the top there, like a thirty two, um, and that's you know that's cool, I guess. Um, oh, again, so when I work in RGB, I, I, sorry, I'm rushing because I'm out of time, um, but I would create a folder here and set it to multiply on top of my inks. So my background layer is my inks now, and I lock that off, and I make a color layer above, and then I make another layer in there, and I call that one my flats, and... And then I can do my flatting in there. So let's let's just do boomerang really quickly, and then I'll be done coloring for the day. So all these little boomerangs are going to be the same color. Um, boomerang, 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 boomerang. Uh, let's throw that selection area, fill it in. Again, my layer is uh, set to multiply. Um, grab, grab, grab. Mm -hmm. Let's 
expand it by a couple pixels. Fill that in. Good enough. I'm not the world's fastest fighter. Uh, <laughs> there are people who can do these pages a lot quicker than I can. Um, my guy, for example. But uh, I enjoy it, so I actually do it uh, whenever I can. Um, I find it extremely relaxing and meditative. Presumably, like those adult coloring books that a lot of people uh, really enjoy. Uh, yeah. So, almost done boomerang here. I could be using the wand for this area, so why don't I? There we go. So anyway, I've shown you how to flat the flying bullseye. Let's grab this page here. And this is what that page looks like once it's flatted. Okay. Now again, I like to just label that flats, and I like to duplicate that layer. So I've got my flats saved on a separate layer, and then I can just go in and start painting, which is a lot of fun. Again, there's there's a lot of ways you can render a thing. I think Ryan Otley's art needs rendering. Um, when I worked on him with him on Invincible, I like to use more cuts. I would go in with my lasso, and I would like select certain areas to make a highlight like this. This is getting rushed because I'm out of time. Um, and then I would just grab a brush and just kind of paint in a highlight like that. Like that. Um, that works. Um, I wanted to kind of evolve my work with him though when I moved on to Amazing Spider-Man. And I started just straight up uh, painting. Um, so I would grab the selection area and simply find a nice highlight color and just, you know, go in there and start adding brush strokes and stuff. <laughs> this is terrible because I ran out of time. There, that's it. That's how it looks. It looks really good. Uh, no, uh, it looks like this once I was done all the painting. So you can look and see here, again, the flats on one layer, and then I just did a bunch of lighting on the figures, kind of put a bit of a rim light on Spidey there to pop them in the foreground. Uh, and then I did some color holds. This little explosion there, again, I made a color hold selection, and I colored the lines themselves. And then just to make a little more separation between the far background, give a sense of scale, I just threw a little glow on top of there, assuming that there's like a light source somewhere off to the top right. So, so sorry that last bit got a bit rushed there. Um, but yeah, hopefully you've got a, a good idea of, uh, of how I at least color a comic book page. Um, further reading class assignment. Um, I read this one, the DC Comics Guide to Coloring and Lettering. Uh, I found it very useful when I first started coloring 15 years ago, learning the the craft. Um, I hope that they've kept uh, the additions up to date because obviously the software advice on here is it's going to be a bit dated. Um, but the uh, the theory side, I mean, it's written by Mark Chirello, who was the guy who figured out the colors of Mike Mangola and Hellboy. Uh, he's a god. I love I love Chi. Um, brilliant man. So definitely worth reading. Um, James Guernsey, Gurney. I uh, did a book called Color and Light, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, it's just, I cannot recommend it enough. I read it cover to cover once every year or two. Uh, it just talks about uh, practical um, side of painting and how we use light and how we use color to tell stories and the way that light uh, works. Uh, and then I also have a book called The Book of Color. I think it's out of print, so you'll probably have trouble finding this one, but I really dug this one. This is more hardcore color theory, um, but quite a good book. <sighs> I think that's it. We're out of time. I'm just going to take a last look at the chat.
uh, and see if I missed anything. How did you get the different color to appear underneath the lighter blue with the layers? I'm not sure I understand that question. Um, but luckily for you, uh, I think I'd probably explain as I go, and this this uh, workshop will be saved, and you can rewind. And, uh, if 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 it's still not clear, I am on Twitter uh, at Nathan Fairbairn, uh, and happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, I guess that's it. I have run over by six minutes. I had fun. Um, I miss Comic Cons. I miss seeing you all. I miss the connection with people. But this has been a really nice way to. Uh, Take it for a bit. Okay, I'm going to now end the stream. Thank you all so much for joining me. If you have any questions, at Nathan Fairburn on Twitter is the best way to ask them. Bye-bye.